Good afternoon again. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. My name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the Energy Resources Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where we facilitate what we call the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group, which is a network of energy companies, transportation agencies, and partner organizations that work together to promote habitat on working landscapes, such as utility and transportation rights of way. We're really excited to present this training webinar on using the recently released Pollinator Habitat Scorecard, which was developed by the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group to support both quantifying and qualifying habitat on energy and transportation lands. This webinar is part of a series we featured this summer on implementing habitat on energy and transportation lands. Um, you can find other webinars in this series on the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group's website, and in a few days there will be a link to a recording of this webinar under the Resources tab. We also post relevant news, best management practices, planning tools, and other resources, in addition to general information about the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group, our upcoming events, past meeting proceedings, as well as working group tools like the scorecard we're going to be talking about today. I want to briefly mention that we have our next working group meeting that will be held in conjunction with the Trees and Utilities Conference next month on September 9th and 10th in Cincinnati, Ohio. We will be featuring a variety of industry updates and technical presentations with a focus on green contracting to help advance habitat initiatives on rights of way. We will also have working sessions and network opportunities. I encourage you to join us um, on our, at our meeting. For more information and to register for the meeting, please visit either our website or the link um, that's on this slide. Before we get started with today's webinar, let me provide a few more logistics items and a couple reminders. So everyone is on mute except for myself and the presenters. If you're having any sort of technical issues, please use the chat box in the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar platform and we'll respond as quickly and as best as we can. Throughout the webinar, please submit any questions that you have um, to our presenters or about the scorecard in the chat box. We've built some time at the end of the presentation for questions. However, you can submit questions and comments at any time throughout the webinar. And lastly, um, as I said before, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar to the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group um, website over the next um, week or so. So now let's turn to our topic for today. We have a lot of information we're excited to cover, both on the background and general information about the scorecard, as well as specifics on using the scorecard and related modules. I'm pleased to have representatives from our technical team that led the development of the scorecard as our presenters on today's webinar. And each of them will present different aspects about the scorecard and then be available to answer questions um, at the end. Today, I'm joined by Allison Caribou, who's the Science Coordinator at Monarch Joint Venture, Eric Anderson, who's a Senior Associate at Environmental Incentives, Hannah Stout, who's an entomologist working for Penn State University, Dan Salas, who's Senior Ecologist at Cardinal, Sydney Mucha, who's Conservation Planning Manager at the Wildlife Habitat Council, and Karen Klinger, who's a GIS Specialist at the Field Museum. Again, I want to especially recognize and thank these individuals and their organizations for leading the charge to develop the cross-sector, multifaceted habitat assessment tool. And their work, especially over the last several months, that's been the culmination of over a year of efforts by the Metrics and Targets Task Force within the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group. So a little bit more detail about the Metrics and Targets Task Force. Um, this forms with the mission of establishing a consistent understanding of how to identify and qualify habitat across energy and transportation lands, particularly habitat for insect pollinators. And as a first task, we identified the need to create a common definition of what we mean by pollinator habitat on energy and transportation lands. From there, we wanted to create a flexible mechanism for measuring and monitoring that habitat, which is how the scorecard evolved. All of this is ultimately intended to support the people who are doing the work on the ground, on rights of way or other lands, to make sure that they have the resources they need to conduct habitat assessment. 
Allison is going to provide some additional background on the development of the definition of pollinator habitat, as well as the framework for the scorecard. But I wanted to briefly identify our primary objectives uh, for the scorecard for you to keep in mind throughout the rest of the presentation. So first, um, the scorecard provides us a common language to talk about habitat on energy and transportation lands. And in doing so, it facilitates both cross-sector learning and collaboration. Secondly, the scorecard establishes a consistent valuation method that we can use across energy and transportation sectors that aligns with existing habitat assessments and reporting mechanisms. Thirdly, the scorecard provides a flexible and multi-tiered approach that meets organizations where they're at in terms of their available resources or expertise and encourages improved levels of detail and monitoring over time. And then lastly, the scorecard supports shared reporting of common metrics across different industries, geographic regions, and organizations. So we can more accurately describe the cumulative value that rights of way and other energy and transportation lands provide for pollinators and other wildlife. I want to also um, specifically acknowledge the generous support of our project sponsors who are shown here. Um, they've provided um, this support to help us get this scorecard across the finish line, um, which was no small task. And we wouldn't have been able to complete this project on such an accelerated timeline without their help. So a big thank you to those of you from these organizations who are on the webinar today. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Allison from Monarch Joint Venture to provide a continued introduction um, to the scorecard and how we got to this thing. Thank you, Iris. So um, just as a bit of background, um, the Metrics and Targets Task Force of the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group thought it was a good idea to create a common definition of ha ha habitat pollinator habitat specifically, that we could all kind of reference. Um, so our definition is that pollinator habitat contains native flowering plants, host plants, nesting sites throughout the growing season. And this is a very brief and simple definition that should be very flexible. Um, in addition, there were a few key points that we pulled together into bullets that could be referenced to provide more clarification. Um, so, the habitat could be remnant natural habitat or native habitat, or it could be habitat that was enhanced through management or even newly created through restoration. We also note that flowering plants provide both nectar and pollen. And um, other points that have come up in a lot of um, discussions about habitat are that a greater diversity of native plants provides a great diversity of floral resources with different phenologies or times when they flower. And they also provide host plants that are important to various different insects um, and nesting sites as well. We also uh, encourage many uh, people encourage managing for native plants again for these multiple benefits to a variety of wildlife species and other ecosystem services such as soil stabilization, water cleansing, and other services. And finally, uh, a recommendation of having three or more blooming native plant species available through both spring, summer, and fall will is a good targeted number for uh, many restorations and is something else that could be shared with the pollinator habitat. So, um, with that sort of as a background, the scorecard, new slide please, um, contains two main modules. The pollinator assessment, um, which contains data regarding field conditions conducted and collected during a site visit. Um, and then secondly, there's a management module, which reflects threats to habitat and opportunities for enhancement. And it the implementation of practices that address threats and take advantage of opportunities for enhancement. So we'll be talking about these two major parts of the scorecard throughout today. On the next slide, we um, 
show how the pollinator assessment uh, implements a tiered approach, which enables um, a range of skill levels and um, time available and also um, the degree of detail that is gained. So for each tier, you increase the amount of information gained, but also the amount of experience and resources required. So this starts with a basic tier, um, tier one, which is just simplistic and the fastest. And tier two gives a qualitative sense of habitat quality sort of categorical. And then at tier three, we gain the greatest detail quantitatively about habitat composition and quality. So um, on the next slide, we thought it would be important to kind of explain uh, why the scorecard is important and how we can envision the success of implementing the scorecard if everybody takes part. Um, the scorecard enables vegetation managers to adopt best management practices and see the improvements that they make in their pollinator habitat on the rights of way. We also um, think the scorecard increases the ability for entities to collaborate and communicate across um, different uh, rights of way managers and other organizations, conservation partners um, on the pollinator habitat. Vegetation managers will great, greatly improve their understanding of what pollinator habitat they may have, where it may be, what quality it's in, and also be able to track the effects of their management practices. And finally, um, having a widespread adoption of consistent practices for monitoring enables us to all communicate and share information, again, across entities, um, which there are so many who are working towards uh, common goals. So, um, the next slide, we're going to, the next three slides, I'm going to just kind of illustrate some of these um, cases that may pertain to your organization or where you sit. So a uh, scorecard can be used to assess pollinator quality. And like I said, it could be used to look at the availability of how along the rights of way, how much there is and what quality it is identify areas where there may be higher quality or opportunities for areas that could be enhanced. And then also it would be um, a way to compare areas under different management practices and see how um, those uh, relate to habitat quality. Another uh, case use would be the scorecard uh, informing management decisions so the scorecard can be used to identify opportunities for pollinator habitat enhancement or creation and also to determine the effectiveness of management actions that are addressing key threats um, to pollinator habitat perhaps within or even outside of the right of way and it's important to realize too that these uh, the scorecard may complement other efforts um, that are being done to track wildlife use or pollinator use or other um, resources that are important and this can all be brought together to support management um, for pollinator habitat. And then finally we want to highlight the utility of the scorecard in facilitating communication. So using the scorecard will allow comparison of habitat qualities across rights of way uh, systems within a company or across a region um, or in peer exchange. These metrics provide a common language around um, among the rights of way as habitat working group members, um, list of their um, organization and um, together, this information can inform the rights of way as working group about habitat status, identifying management uh, opportunities, and uh, identifying information needs, and just generally uh, learn more about the um, habitat that we provide.
Thanks, Allison. Um, <clears throat> so when we began designing the pollinator scorecard, we knew from the feedback that we had received on earlier versions that the scorecard had to work for a variety of people uh, with different backgrounds and for organizations that had different purposes for using the scorecard. We also knew that the scorecard was too cumbersome or didn't provide the right level of detail, it wouldn't be used. So we went through an exercise to help us better understand who would use the scorecard and why. Through that exercise, we came up with these three profiles of potential scorecard users. Keep in mind that these profiles are not meant to capture every single person who might use the scorecard. <clears throat> also in this industry, people wear many hats, so you may see yourself in one, two, or even all three of these profiles. The purpose of these profiles was simply to help us put ourselves in the shoes, so to speak, of potential users. So first we have the wingtips. These folks may be environmental compliance managers, permitting managers, or on the corporate social responsibility team. They're worried about maintaining operations, reducing regulatory risk, and developing relationships in the community. Second, we have the steel toes. Steel toes represent the vegetation managers, field crews, and operation staff. They maintain operability and safety by managing vegetation and maintaining equipment. Steel toes have great insight into the opportunities in their managed lands for pollinator habitat. However, they may not have a strong background in botany or ecology. On the other hand, we have the tevas. Tevas may be more practiced with inventories and assessments and may have more experience with plant identification. Tevas will be best able to conduct more intensive assessment and monitoring of pollinator habitat. And we wanted to provide an opportunity for this type of user to collect all of the data that they can instead of being frustrated that important information. What we learned through this exercise is that the users of the pollinator scorecard have a wide range of reasons for using the scorecard and a wide range of experience in terms of habitat assessment. We realized that we couldn't simply make one scorecard that would work for everybody. Therefore, we've developed the scorecard to meet as many of these needs as possible and be used by a variety of different people while still maintaining consistency across the data collected. Next slide, please. Okay, so where can the scorecard be used? The scorecard can be used anywhere land managers wish to describe habitat. It might be a single planting, such as a pollinator planting around your corporate campus, a specific right-of-way corridor, or an area where maybe you're testing new management. However, keep in mind that there are a variety of tools for habitat assessment at your disposal. And when there's a tool that's more specific to your needs, for example, a state solar pollinator scorecard, consider using those instead or in addition to the pollinator scorecard. As you might imagine, there's a difference between assessing a small patch of habitat and assessing a larger corridor. I'll need to define a few terms to help us understand how to use the scorecard on different sized habitats. Next slide, please. So this map illustrates three different terms we'll need to know to use the scorecard. So in this example, the yellow box outlines the management area. A management area is an area where policy level management decisions may exist. For example, an area over which you are applying integrated vegetation management. The management area is the unit of analysis for the management module, which we'll cover later. A site is the area that we are interested in assessing with the scorecard. We typically think of a site as the area where conservation actions can be taken. And finally, a plot is a 1500 square foot area within the assessment, within which the assessment is conducted. One pollinator scorecard data sheet is filled out for each plot. In most cases, multiple plots are used to characterize a site or a management area. To recap, we'll assess pollinator habitat within multiple plots to characterize the habitat within a site or within a management area. And we'll revisit these concepts when we walk through an example habitat assessment. Next slide, please. So when should you conduct the habitat assessment? 
Well, importantly, the pollinator scorecard only requires a single site visit to get a reasonable estimate of habitat quality. What we're trying to do is to characterize the floor resources available on the site, but that will change over the course of a year. Therefore, the timing of the site visit is important. Ideally, you should time the site visit during peak bloom for your region. The more nectar plants in bloom when you visit, the higher your score will be, and the better reflection it will be for the value of that site for pollinators. In any case, if you're going to revisit a site in subsequent years, try to complete the assessment at a similar time of year. You can, if you'd like, revisit the site multiple times in a single year. What we're collecting is data on potentially flowering nectar plants, and those are any plants that exhibit signs that they are currently blooming, have recently bloomed, or will soon bloom. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna walk through the pollinator habitat assessment protocol. Next slide. An important question for you before you use the pollinator scorecard is, which tier should I use? Keep in mind that you can use all three tiers in different areas of your right of way or for different purposes. The data are tiered such that you can still compare across tiers if you, for example, use tier two on most of your right of way and tier three only on the highest priority areas. The biggest difference between the tiers is the amount of information and the precision of the habitat assessment. Tier three will provide more information and a more precise estimate of habitat quality than tier two similarly for tier two and tier one, but you may not always need that level of detail. In some cases, it will be better to do more plots than to do fewer plots more intensively. So let me walk through each tier so you can make a more informed decision about which tier or tiers you might wanna use. Tier one is the most basic assessment. It is intended to help you quickly determine whether pollinator habitat is present and it requires only a few minutes per plot. Tier two is intended for a user that doesn't have much botany experience, but without needing to identify any plant species, you can get a fairly accurate understanding of the quality of the pollinator habitat in about 10 minutes per plot. Tier three is intended for users that want a robust data set and a more precise estimate of pollinator habitat quality. It requires more time for each plot, but provides data that can be used to study the changes in habitat over time in response to different management actions. In order to complete a tier three assessment, you will need some botany experience. Next slide. So now let's walk through the process of assessing habitat. I'll assume that you have already selected the tier that you would like to use for this particular assessment. As an aside, you are more than welcome to keep the pollinator habitat uh, scorecard data sheets in your truck and use them whenever you'd like. Just jump out, fill out a scorecard. However, to be able to generalize from the specific area that you assessed, in other words, the plot, to your rights of way more generally, you'll wanna follow the process I'm about to outline, which will provide a more statistically robust data set. To complete this process, you'll need the appropriate permits and permissions, your safety gear, the right data sheet for the tier selected, and any additional items that might be helpful in the field. For a full list of recommended items, see the Pollinator Scorecard User's Guide. Next slide. So step one will be to set up your site assessment. First, you wanna determine the area where you'd like to assess pollinator habitat. The area of interest is what we refer to as a site. In this example, we've defined two sites, site A and site B, Site A is a corridor and Site B is the area around this spe that specific facility. We may want to compare these sites or maybe these sites have or uh, have been or will be subject to different management and that's why we've split them into two sites. Next, determine the number of plots you will assess. The number of plots you want to assess will depend on the precision of the information you require. So the more plots you collect, the higher the resolution of the data. We would generally recommend that you collect as many plots as possible given your resource constraints. And we hope to provide more specific recommendations once we have more data. It'll be great if people use the scorecard this year so that we can use that information to provide a better recommendation. Finally, 
you'll distribute the plots across the site. Again, plots are the specific areas of habitat that you will assess. A plot is a rectangle 150 feet long and 10 foot wide, or a circle with a radius of 22 feet. You or your field crew will visit each plot and complete a pollinator scorecard data sheet for that plot. You can distribute plots in a number of ways. The most important thing to keep in mind when distributing plots is that anywhere within the site has an equal probability of being selected as a plot. So we can't just put plots where we know the habitat is, we need to use a better strategy to distribute those plots. So how might we do this? One way is to distribute plots systematically. You will simply spread the plots across the site with equal spacing. Every mile or quarter of a mile, you will assess another plot and continue that way across the entire site. This works really well for long linear corridors. Another way is to distribute plots randomly. This is best for large areas that are not linear, for example, site B. Use a GIS or random number generator to generate random point locations within the site that will serve as the corners of the plots. Finally, you may place a plot in an area that is representative of the site. Generally, this should only be done with smaller areas, and it's best not to pool data from representative plots with data from random or systematic plots. Next slide. So to recap, plots can be distributed in a systematic, random, or representative way. Generally, we would recommend using a systematic approach for linear corridors and a random approach for nonlinear sites. Representative plots can be placed where the person doing the assessment believes the plot will best represent the habitat as a whole, but keep in mind that this is generally only possible for smaller sites and shouldn't be combined with data from random or systematic plots. So we can't use data from representative plots to say something about our rights of way more generally. We can only use that data to say something about the specific site we are trying to represent. And that's an important limitation for representative plots. Next slide. So step two is to record the site data, such as the site name and the size of the site in acres. Often this step is completed in the field, but if you're going to complete multiple plots for a single site, you might consider filling this out on the data sheet beforehand and printing copies for the field already filled out. That'll speed things up in the field quite a bit. Step three will be to actually collect the plot scale data by navigating to the plot and recording data on the pollinator scorecard data sheet. We'll repeat step three until we've collected all of the plots. Next slide. So what will we be collecting? The specific attributes evalu evaluated will vary based on the tier selected, but the attributes generally include things like the cover of potentially flowering nectar plants, milkweed abundance, presence of specific pollinator habitat resources, pollinators observed, and threats or opportunities present. The number of unique nectar species and information on whether those species are native or invasive is collected for tier three only. Please refer to the user's guide and data sheets themselves for more information on the attributes evaluated at each tier. Next slide. After completing the pollinator scorecard at tier two or tier three, you'll get a quantitative score for each plot assessed. Basically, each attribute is associated with a score, and those scores are added up to get the plot score. The higher the score, the better. We've provided these categories to help you better interpret what the score means. These categories are also provided on each data sheet. So next, Hannah Stout will provide a demonstration of the scorecard. I'll turn it over to Hannah. Thanks, Eric. For the last three years, I've been working with Penn State on different entomological surveys at three different research rights of ways. Currently, we're in this plant and wild bee diversity survey season. So earlier this summer, I asked a colleague to test an earlier version of the scorecard by performing tier three assessments at two of our research plots. Next slide. Now here are some before treatment photos of these two plots. On the left 
is plot one, which is traditionally a broadcast application of herbicides. And um, this is done every four to five years. On the right is plot five, which is traditionally a low volume basal uh, treatment plot with the same treatment schedule as plot one. So it's very targeted applications of just uh, you know, problem plants, not a broadcast spray. So as I said, these are the pre-treatment photos. Next slide. And here are the post-treatment photos from that same year. Now, as you can see, the borders on both have been removed, but on the left, here, there's been the broadcast spraying of herbicide. And on the right, you see that they've left the not problem vegetation. And um, traditionally in the past, our biodiversity surveys have shown greater abundance, richness, and diversity at the plots more like plot five on the right than at plot one on the, the left. Okay, next slide. So to fill out to fill out the uh, scorecard, tier three is four pages. And at the top of the page, I we put the site name, which is State Game Lands 33. And at the time that we test this scorecard, there was not a set plot size. Uh, so we used our default, which is our study plot size. It's already flagged and already delineated. This took about 20 minutes for our assessor to do. And since we specifically selected this, these plots, these are representative surveys. Next. Okay, so plot number one, which is that broadcast application in 2016. The location is Rush Township, Center County, Pennsylvania. And it is an energy and research right away. Oh, and adjacent land use is it's within a state game land, so it's heavily forested. So it's a woodland adjacent land use. Next. Okay. Uh, so here we start with the attributes. And for potentially flowering nectar plant cover, our assessor would just uh, walk the the site, walk the plot, and estimate how much uh, plant cover there was. Just eyeballing it, she estimated 11 to 25 percent. Now, as additional habitat resources, as she walked the plot, she noticed the uh, presence of native bunch grasses, deadwood snags, rock piles, and more than one square foot of bare ground, which is excellent basking and nesting. Plants with hollow pithy stems. And at the time she selected larval host plants uh, for dog bane, but uh, we'll see later on that I noticed that there was gooseberry, so I made sure that that was, was selected. So we had six habitat resources there times three, which is 18. Now, in the last bottom two rows, we have the number of nectar plant species and a number of native nectar plant species. And the asterisk there is because on pages three and four of the scorecard, there are plant species worksheets. So this makes filling those two out really, really simple. So we're gonna look at those worksheets next. Okay, so as I said, she filled out the scorecard in a previous version, and I transcribed it to the new version, and the old version didn't have the checkboxes for native or, bl or blooming, so I had to go by her notes. And she also, she would know herself if some things like the sink foil that she had observed, the yarrow or the wood sorrel were of the native species or of the non-native species. So I had to put a question mark in there when filling that out. But as you can see, there are 12 uh, different plants listed and there are seven different checkboxes for native and three for blooming. So then we would transcribe those numbers to the first page. There was a, a neither plot had a milkweed species there.
And this was this was interesting because hay scented fern is a native plant, but we're noticing that at our two plots that it's becoming more and more abundant and it's crowding out flowering resources. So whether or not this can be considered invasive, I don't know, but it is uh, important that we mention this to the rights of way managers because we are concerned that maybe it's we're going to see some drop in diversity. Okay, so as I said, abundance of milkweed, it was zero. And she estimated the invasive species in noxious weed cover, which she called uh, hay scented fur, to be 11 to 25% at plot one. But this these are pretty good plots for pollinators. So we pretty much can check just about everything on there. Um, both plots had uh, the same numbers of pollinators observed. As far as threats go, you know, as I said, see page four, which is concerning the hay scented fern, um, but otherwise it's very well managed, both, or both of these research plots. And as for opportunities, we always, always try to get people out there to, to, to visit our plots. Many of you have already done that. So I just checked that off because, you know, this is, that's what we love to do. It's very important. So comparing the, the two plots, when I tallied up the scores, for plot one, the broadcast plot, we had a score of 43, which is pretty good. That's robust habitat according to the scorecard. Now for plot five, which is the next slide. Oh. For plot five, the, the value was greater than for plot one and uh, which reflects very well in our, our bee diversity data, our plant diversity data, and um, pretty much all of our surveys that we do, we do see more diversity in the uh, low volume targeted plots than we do in the broadcast plots. And also, um, even though this is, you know, this is a research plot for scientists, this is really exciting to us. It's a, because now we have a standardized and quantitative record of the flowering vegetation and other plot conditions in our plots. And we can easily share this amongst, you know, the three user types that we saw mentioned earlier. So, you know, even, even the scientists are excited about this. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Anna and Eric. I um, want to transition now into the management module of the, uh, the uh, pollinator habitat scorecard. So, um, until now, we've been looking at evaluating components um, at our plots to evaluate the habitat condition. And early on in some of the discussions with the metrics and targets task force within the working group, there was a desire to also account for management actions that are undertaken on the areas and to, to sort of assess the, you know, the value or the, you know, the appropriateness of those actions. <clears throat> so that led us to uh, develop this management module uh, by which we can do that. And so we evaluate management aside from the habitat condition. And uh, then at the back end of this, we can put the management module together with the habitat assessment scores to really get a full picture of both the habitat quality condition as well as the practices that we're undertaking to manage those areas. And so when we think about management on rights of ways, if you go to the next slide, please, there's several ways we can approach this. Right, and, and there's other methods of looking at this out there. Oftentimes, when we think about management actions and evaluating those, we might think of things like the frequency at which we're managing uh, actions. So, how often are we mowing or spraying? Uh, we might think about the the intensity of those actions. So, uh, in, in, in terms of frequency, how much of the area, or um, you know. Uh, how much of a target are we controlling through types of actions? 
we might also look at the types of actions themselves. So there might be a preference towards doing more of one type of action versus more of another. And as we looked at the management module, we, we, we talked about these different approaches and how we might do that. And we settled on this approach, which was really based more on effectiveness and targetedness of the actions themselves. So the management module, as we presented it in, in this tool, really involves focusing on two aspects that are fundamental to habitat management. One is that actions can either minimize threats that are impacting the, the target or goals of our site, or we can enhance needed resources that help improve what we're trying to accomplish there. So when we think about something like pollinator habitat, we might have threats such as invasive species or, um, you know, uh, off-site management that's now impacting our, our habitat. Uh, there might be things then, uh, you know, things like that that, could in, that are threats to the current condition and the quality of our site. So if left unchecked, those threats would further degrade the quality of the habitat on site. On the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the ability to enhance needed elements. So if we think about resources that can, that might be present, but we could further improve to make the habitat better for, for pollinators. Um, these are the types of actions at that end. So two examples there would be things like supplemental planting or seeding. Maybe we have a, a diversity of species already, but if we conduct some supplemental seeding or planting, we can further enhance diversity and improve that site even more. Um, also, there might be nesting resources that are maybe limited or less abundant, and so if we um, add some of those resources, we can, we can further improve nesting on site. And so thinking across the spectrum and that each site, depending on our management approach, uh, you know, might have a range of threats or needed resources present. So let's go to the next slide. So through the protocol, we want to evaluate um, both those threats and opportunities and then the management taken to address both of those. And so the management module is broken up into two parts. Um, I'll highlight them here briefly, and then we'll get into a couple of examples of how that actually works out in terms of the tool, and then talk a little about how the, the scoring and the application of those results apply. So the two parts of the management protocol are based on this approach of thinking about threats managed versus opportunities uh, available and managed. And so first off, um, as you may have noticed in the example that Hannah went through, uh, there's a spot where you can check off threats present and opportunities available at the particular site. So right there, you can use the, the habitat assessment to inform the management module um, in these two parts. And so if you're using the scorecard, this first step for the threats and opportunities managed is already completed. So determining what manageable threats are present. And we wanted to clarify that, that specifically here we're concerned with manageable threats. There might be some other threats that are outside of your control as a right-of-way manager or a property manager. And so for each of these, we clarified that the threat or opportunity is considered manageable if it's feasible. So there's actually something we can do about it at the site, that it's appropriate and targeted so that the action is going to directly address the threat or improve that opportunity. And last, there's no other constraints that would prevent that activity. So, um, yeah, there's no constraints from a regulatory standpoint, from land ownership, or other easement restrictions that would prevent you from doing those actions. So if it hits all those, then the opportunity is available or that threat is a manageable one. So we want you to assess those what's present at your, at your site, and then think about which of those were managed over the past year. And then for those that were managed over the past year, uh, assess on some predetermined scales we have uh, the scale of that management and the persistence in terms of the results of that action that were taken that year. So I'll show you some examples of how that works out. Uh, and then basically after we finish that for the threats, we go through and do a, the same approach for the opportunities. So we define which opportunities are present, which ones were managed and addressed, and then what's the scale and persistence of those. Go to the next slide. So I did mention that these are at a site level. And so 
unlike the the habitat assessment, which is based on a plot-based, uh, the management module can be addressed across the site. Although the caveat being, if at a particular site your management regime does change from one part of that site to another, then you could do the management module at a plot basis. But being that most sites are managed through a similar regime, uh, we figure that one module per site is typically all that will be required. So we do want to align the management module with places where you've done the habitat assessment. So again, the, the power of both of those together is really helpful to inform future management. So the header of this aligns with some of the information you're already completing for the habitat assessment. So by completing it here, adding that information here, uh, we can tie those those sites together, and you can further inform um, you know the results that you have based on that. The management module, in terms of um, sort of the, the required qualification, should be completed by somebody who's knowledgeable with the management conducted at that site. So it could potentially be the same person who's completing the who's completing the uh, habitat assessment, although it doesn't have to be. It could be somebody else who might be more familiar with the management itself at that site. It can speak to the scale and effectiveness at which it was conducted. And then, of course, with any tool, we leave ample note space. We can add in extra detail regarding the, um, the site itself or the management conducted or the context within. So as I go through examples, you'll see these light blue cells, and all the light blue cells in the tool are ones where we can enter information, and then the other cells are ones that are, are auto-populated or pre-populated for use. So the next slide. So I have one example here. This is a, a, a state highway roadside adjacent to a school that contains a restored prairie with some mixed native plants in the roadside. So as you can see, you know, there's maybe some sunflowers, uh, maybe some milkweed, uh, a lot of smooth brome, maybe some Canada, Canada thistle, things like that mixed here in, in, this, in this roadside. So they fill out their, their top information, and then from there we move into part one of our scorecard. If you go to the next slide. So part one is looking at our threats managed. So on the far left, we have the common threats that are posed to pollinator habitat. So under that second column, the first column that's uh, light blue, you're allowed to select yes or no, whether or not you have those threats present. And so if you select yes, that row becomes uh, highlighted with a dark blue. You can then select from a dropdown of recommended action to treat that particular threat. So in this case, for invasive species, like I said, there might be um, uh, prevalence of smooth brome and Canada thistle at this site. We can select from a drop-down of options, or you can autofill your own your own treatment or recommendations. We say, okay, we should conduct uh, targeted herbicide treatments of those invasive species. So then the next column with the yeses and nos is, where, was that recommended action taken over the past year? And so in this case, they said yes, they did conduct uh, herbicide treatments of those invasive species. And then we get into the next column, which is details on that treatment. So one is, the first column is the scale of the treatment. So where we had invasive species at this site, how much of that was treated? So here they said they are treating the entirety of the invasive species at the site, so over 90% of it. So they had a treatment scale that addressed all the areas of concern. And then when asked about the persistence of you know, how long will that treatment basically have results that we can we can rely on. Uh, because of the, the tenacity of some of these and, and the treatments used, they felt like there would be a limited or short-term improvement. So if they didn't go back out there, when would sort of the, the effectiveness of that treatment um, sort of be overwhelmed at that point? And so we, we've assumed one to three years at this particular location for this. So based on that, the effectiveness was determined to, be to, to mostly address the threat present at the site, and that gets a numeric score of four. And I'll talk a little bit more about the effectiveness of the action and the score and, and where that comes from here after this demo. So in this scenario at the bottom, you can see the percent of the threats managed was 100%. 
And because of the effectiveness score, um, it, it summarizes it there at the bottom compared to the max possible. So that's part one. If you go to part two, it's very similar. We have the opportunities available. And so, as mentioned, this, this roadside is adjacent to a school, so there's some intent to use this for public education um, <clears throat> with the school. And in this case, let's say they did one school event where they got the, um, the students out to you know, do a trash pickup or something from a volunteer basis. They could use it from that, or that educational or outreach perspective. They could do that across the, the majority of this site, but it was a one-time event. So we're hitting that population for one time, and uh, that may or may not be a reoccurring. So we weren't sure if this would happen again next year. So for the persistence, we selected that this is a seasonal improvement. This was a, sort of a one-time event. And so for that, combined with the scale, this was considered partially addressed that opportunity with a score of three. And so you can see at the bottom again, the percent managed was 100%. Um, with our score, we get an opportunity score of 15 out of 25. And then at the bottom in that yellow box, we have a combination of the uh, management score and the qualitative rating. All right, if we can go next slide. And just to keep us on time, I'm going to go through this quickly. Here we have an energy site, so a transmission line being treated. Next slide. So here we have several threats. We have wind encroachment that was uh, mechanically removed, invasive species again and potentially some encroachment from, from some neighbors who decided to you know, maybe mow portions of the right-of-way. So you can see, again, we can indicate what was done, the scale and persistence of those treatments, and we get scores associated with those. Next slide. Okay, with the opportunities implemented, we were able to seed uh, one particular area that was identified as an enhancement area, so that was addressed. And you can see because of some of the, the partially addressing of some of the threats, this site actually re receives a lower score uh, comparatively. Let's go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, some of the scores um, are relevant to the, how much the threat or opportunity was addressed. And so as you can see here across the top, the persistence is based on uh, how long we'll have a management effect resulting from that treatment. On the far left, it's the scale of, of that site being addressed through the management. And so the best score is for, say, sites that are completely addressed, areas that are addressed the entirety of the site and that have a long-term lasting impact. Uh, conversely, the lowest scores are areas that address the smallest or minority of the site and a marginal improvement or basically are maintaining the status quo. And so again, improved scores based on uh, longer lasting larger scale improvements. Next slide. So uh, the management score is basically the sum of the uh, threats that are managed and their effectiveness over the, the max possible score that you could have for those categories. Um, in addition to the maximum, or sorry, the, the sum of uh, opportunities managed and their effectiveness over the possible sum of opportunities that are present. So the management module in effect is basically scoring how well you've been able to effectively manage some of those threats and opportunities relative to the potential for that site. And so to improve that score for each site, you're basically addressing, you improve that score by addressing all the threats and opportunities as effectively as you possibly can. And I should, should note, if you happen to have a site that has no threats and no opportunities, then the management is considered to be exemplary. So as you go through the scoring, um, much like the habitat assessment, we have these brackets broken up based on the scores received to just help inform and indicate, again, does your management sort of fall across the spectrum of possibilities there? And so you can use this then to evaluate site by site um, what management is being done, how effective is it, and opportunities that you can improve from there. So combining that with the habitat assessment, you can really paint a full picture of the habitat condition and things that you're doing to maintain or improve that. And um, using that, you can inform those future decisions to, to uh, inform future management from there. 
All right, from there, uh, move on to Sydney. Thanks, Dan. And like Dan said, you know, what's next? You know, after you've completed the scorecard and you've done the management module, you want to utilize it to continue the process. And we want to help you with those next steps by helping you continue your journey of supporting sustainable pollinator populations, driving momentum, and help you guys tell your story. And one of the first ways to do that that we recommend, next slide, is it practicing adaptive management. So all the monitoring data that you've collected will be instrumental in identifying potential issues with the habitat and guiding continuous improvements that will increase the value of the habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. And some of the questions that are really beneficial for you to ask during this phase um, to practice your adaptive management are up on the screen, you know, is plant diversity being maintained or increased? Is there a need to add more plants? Are you experiencing die-offs? Are you not getting that diversity that you want? Are there blooms throughout the season? Are you achieving what we recommend is having, you know, blooms in spring, summer, and fall to be there when the migrations happen? Are there non-compatible or invasive species impeding your habitat goals? Are you seeing a lot of species outcompete what you would consider, consider valuable pollinator habitat. And are there management actions on the management module that you know you could utilize to improve some of the habitat conditions or use going forward to telling your stories? You know, there are several ways that you can engage partners and engage and gain knowledge through monitoring and consulting best management practices, some of which are on the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group website that are available for you. And the next way to kind of really get going in continuing your journey is participating in citizen science. Next slide. Um, there are lots of ways to enhance those monitoring efforts that you're doing with the scorecard. And some of these kind of citizen science projects will accept the pollinator scorecard as monitoring for their initiatives as, as it is. So some of the ones that we recommend are the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, which is this national initiative to monitor monarchs and their habitats, including those on rights of ways to inform conservation decisions, you know, things such as milkweed density, nectar plants, uh, monarchs that are utilizing the site will be helpful for this to help uh, understand why monarch populations um, are potentially in decline in your area. The Western Monarch Milkweed Wap Mapper does a very similar thing. They're utilizing volunteer uploaded photos of milkweeds and monarchs to build a data set in that western range of the monarch. That's really informing conservation needs in that specific area. There are also volunteer programs like iNaturalist where you can map a variety of different things such as insects and plants throughout that. You're also able to see monarch tagging um, is another good way to do, go through those as well as the North American Butterfly Association count circles, which are utilizing 15-mile radiuses for counts that are occurring over a time. This, this count allows for great interactions with other conservationists, as well as reaching out to your community members. Project Bud Burst is another great one run by the National Science Foundation that collects information on leaf, uh, timing of leafing, blooming, and fruiting ph phases of plants that are beneficial for your pollinators and understanding how they're being affected by the changes in climate that we're seeing right now. And then Bee Spotter is a wonderful citizen science program run by the University of Illinois collecting data on bumblebee and European honeybee observations in the, in the state. And then going on to really telling your story with the next slide. There are lots of different uh, certifications that help you express your voluntary conservation efforts that you're doing there. And one of them is the Wildlife Habitat Conservation Certification, which is the only voluntary sustainability standard to recognize corporate biodiversity efforts. 
the certification recognizes over 26 types of projects grouped into four different categories, habitat, which can be including grasslands that you're doing, uh, landscaped areas as well, species, which, you know, we recognize monarchs as well as species of concern as they're being potentially listed. Education, so getting together with community partners to implement these monitoring efforts, as well as other options such as IVM. The right-of-way of stewardship council accreditation also establishes standards for row vegetation managers and through their accreditation, their four-phase accreditation program through inquiry, um, through statement of work and their on-site assessment of a team of auditors coming out to see how the IVM is being implemented. Uh, a report is developed and a recommendation is given for the accreditation. And then Monarch Way Station also runs through Monarch Watch where you can where you can submit uh, various different types of information to provide milkweed plants, caterpillars, nectar sources uh, for adult butterflies as well as shelter for the butterflies as they migrate through to be uh, classified as a monarch way station. It's a wonderful activity and a wonderful certification that really provides a lot of opportunities for those community involvement. And then the next slide has uh, a little bit more information on the Monarch Conservation Agreement with assur assurances that many of you are already probably very familiar with um, that aims to create more than 2 million acres of habitat on the energy and transportation land. This voluntary conservation agreement really is incentivizing the creation of the monarch butterfly habitat and provides kind of a regulatory certainty and operational flexibility for ongoing row management. And we are all in luck that this team has a foresight to really uh, capitalize on the scorecard, whereas Pier 1 uh, meets the monitoring requirements under the CCAA. And uh, another option where the CCAA comes into play, Karen will touch on a little bit with uh, her, her aspect. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am with the Field Museum, and we've been working with the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group to develop a geospatial habitat database, which serves as a repository for tracking and reporting out on areas managed as habitat by Rights of Way organizations. This data includes center lines, which are the locations of Rights of Way features, as well as the management areas and sites, and also the pollinator scorecard plot locations. Uh, this data is hosted through ArcGIS Online, and it allows organizations to manage their organization's data and also to view data that is shared by, shared by organizations in the database so that you can facilitate uh, collaborations. So on the right here, you see an example from a demo uh, we do where you can see your organization's data, the top four layers, and then you can also see all of the shared data. So that will foster ideas of where you can collaborate to support habitat. Uh, in addition, there will also be a public dashboard, which allows stakeholders and the general public to view a summary of the total acres that are being managed as habitat at a county level, and also report out acreages based on organization name or type. The database will also provide a reporting mechanism to support the CCA compliance, as Sydney was just talking about. If you are already collecting data using your own setup, you can import that data into the database and we'll provide workflows and help support on that procedure. But we also have uh, ready to use data collection mechanisms, including collector for ArcGIS and Survey123. Uh, so on the next slide, you can see here is a Survey123 application specifically designed for the pollinator scorecard. It allows the user to select the tier that they are using and based on that, it is dynamic. So if you select Tier 1, you will get the fields that are relevant to that tier. Same with Tier 2s and Tier 3. It also automatically calculates the pollinator score. So as you select the potentially flowering nectar plant cover, your total score will add up to that value and so on. So every additional uh, thing you select will add to that total score. So you're actively seeing uh, your score in real time. And once that data is submitted, it is automatically added to the geospatial habitat database. So no need to do anything further. Uh, next slide. So if you're interested in learning more about the database or also learning more about our Survey123 tool, 
You can watch a webinar recording from the February Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group meeting. And you can also contact myself or Mark Johnson here at the Field Museum, and we'd be happy to work with you uh, to get involved. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thanks again to all our panelists who um, have gone through a lot of uh, a lot of detailed information very quickly. Um, I wanted to just before we move into the Q and A, um, first remind you all again if you have any questions um, to submit them into the chat box. We have some time here at the end. Um, we can review and answer um, your questions hopefully. Um, but also wanted to. Um, to put forth a challenge to all of you who are on the phone. Um, we're really eager to get feedback and test out this scorecard. Um, this is a slightly different version of a scorecard than um, what we tested last summer. Um, so we're really eager to um, see how it works for all of you. Um, we're also interested in having some initial data from this field season um, that we can um, you know, review and share um, with the larger Rights of Way of Habitat Working Group um, when we have our meeting um, next month um, in September. And so uh, with that, our challenge is for you to use this um, scorecard, either Tier 1, Tier 2, or Tier 3, um, over the next month. Um, submit those completed scorecards to us. I have Nicole's contact information here. Um, she works on our team. And at the fall working group meeting, um, we will not only um, provide a summary of the data and the feedback that we've received um, on the scorecard through testing this summer, um, but also we will recognize the organizations that um, either submit the most scorecards, so that's one opportunity to be recognized, or secondly, if you score the best habitat. Um, and presumably, I think we'll do that um, in both Tier 2 and Tier 3 categories. So um, with that, again, encourage you um, to use the, use the scorecard, get out there, try it out, let us know how it works for you. Um, and again, um, open to any suggestions um, or questions that you have. As we move into, again, the Q&A, um, I also wanted to remind you all how to access the scorecard. Um, so we've sent out a number of um, emails and communications to the broader working group, um, but if you haven't been on those communications um, or you're interested in pulling up the scorecard right now as we're on the webinar, um, the easiest way to get to it is to go to our website, um, look up resources and then tools from the top menu bar, and then under assessment tools, um, you will get um, the top four documents there are the user's guide, which goes into even more detail um, than what we went through today on how to use um, the scorecard and management module, as well as the three-tier data sheet and then the Excel spreadsheet um, management module. So with that, um, let's turn to questions. And our first question, um, I'm going to ask Eric to respond to. Um, sounds like we have a, a DOT or a roadside manager here who's been um, already using the Tier 3 scorecard, which is great to hear. Um, but they've found that um, most all of their sites are scoring over 20 points, um, again, using the Tier 3 scorecard, um, which, in their opinion, includes some sites that they don't think are particularly good pollinator habitat. So they're interested in. Um, and your thoughts on how to interpret those results um, and how to go from here. Thanks, Iris. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'll, uh, I'll address that. And, um, you know, thanks, first and foremost, for using the scorecard. Um, it's good feedback to get. When we were originally um, creating those categories, we had a limited data set, but we did have some data. Um, from Minnesota and Oklahoma. And so, um, it, you know, one of the things that we'd like to do is to um, have you all use the, the scorecard this first year, provide us that information so that we can come up with a better, uh, maybe better categories for the scoring ranges. Um, you know, what we tried to do is just one, recognize that not all rights of way are going to be um, prairie restorations. And so the opportunity there may be a little bit less than 
um, than in some other sites, but we didn't want to um, be unreasonable about what the expectations were. Um, sounds like maybe we've missed the mark there, at least for the sites that you're looking at. Um, and, and so, yeah, we'd, we'd be very interested in, in taking a look at your data um, and anyone else's data that they'd like to contribute, and we can think about maybe adjusting those scores. I will say that you can always just compare the quantitative score between two sites, um, recognize that a, a quantitative score that's very close to each other, there may not be a, a real difference there, but when you do have a difference between 55 and 30, um, you can certainly say that the 55 site is better than the 30 site. Okay, great. Um, we have another question here, um, which might be appropriate for Hannah or Allison, uh, but the question is, what role do bunch grasses play in supporting pollinating insects? Hi, um, just real quick. Um, bunch grasses, uh, some of it is nesting habitat for say wild bees. Um, there are some uh, butterflies, just specifically skippers that use grasses, uh, their larvae use them as host plants. So they're, they're pretty important. Uh, it's, it's a habitat in a, in a larval host thing. Allison, if you have anything else. Um, the only other thing would be if the bunch grasses are indeed growing in bunches and providing a bit of open soil, um, the open ground can also be a resource for ground nesting bees. Um, as far as our demo today, um, we primarily went into detail on the Tier 3 scorecard. Um, Eric or Hannah, would either of you um, be able to give a little bit more explanation on the level of detail required for Tier 1 or Tier 2? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Um, so with Tier 3, we'll be collecting um, data on species composition. So we'll actually write down the, a list of species and, um, and then to some extent we can estimate the cover per species uh, for the invasives. So we won't do that for tier two. The expectation is that um, we're not identifying individual species. We're just looking for different types of um, flowering plants or potentially flowering plants. Um, and then there's a few other things. Uh, being able to identify milkweed is still important in tier two, but that's the only the plant that we would need to be able to identify specifically. Um, and then at tier one, we're really just uh, confirming whether or not milkweed is present and whether or not there is greater than 10% cover of potentially flowering nectar plants. Um, so again, that doesn't require any species ID, just simply looking at the plot um, with the exception of being able to identify uh, milkweed. Um, how about a definition for basking areas? Okay, um, basking areas, uh, we're talking about like uh, open pa patches of bare ground that could be good nesting areas. Also, um, Butterflies like to aggregate, especially males. They like to find uh, mineral deposits. So um, they'll, they'll gather to where there's maybe some salts and minerals. So that's pretty important. You know, the, the males need those salts in order to be more reproductively uh, viable. I hope that helped. Um, and how would you describe kind of identifying basking areas? I just uh, big patches of bare dirt. That's the best way to to identify that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was just going to add. I think it implies that the area is sunny as well. Right. Yes. One piece of feedback we've gotten already is um, a request to include some definitions um, in the user guide. So I think that's something um, we'll be adding as well.
So Karen, um, can you talk about um, how to access Survey123 through the Collector app um, and whether or not it's available right now and, and how to go about um, downloading or accessing it? Uh, sure. sure. Uh, the opponent scorecard is in final review process, so will be ready shortly. However, you do have to be a member of the database to uh, view it. Um, so once you reach out to Mark or myself, um, we'll set you up. You have to you fill in a questionnaire to set up your organization. And then from there, you can easily download the Survey123 application, and that will allow you to immediately start collecting data. And so that data will go into your organization's database, uh, your organization's data. Um, so that, that will be combined with all of the other database uh, information. Yep, and we pulled up uh, Mark and Karen's contact information again. And the same is true also for Collector, uh, for the Collector app. That those, so w once we set up your organization's uh, group in ArcGIS Online, then you'll have access to uh, download those Collector maps as well. So it's all pretty much ready to go. Once again, you just kind of have to contact us and we'll start the process. Thank you. Um, how about um, any thoughts on the best time of year to conduct um, the scorecard sampling or monitoring? Um, in, in many cases, I think that will be July or August. Um, I suppose there will be exceptions to any guidelines, but um, from the upper West, I would say that's um, our peak blooming time. Okay. Well, we'll wait for um, any other questions that come in from the audience. Um, but while we do that, I just open it up to our technical team, um, our panelists today, and see if they have anything else they'd like to add or point people to as they prepare to use the scorecard. So I have uh, one, one thing regarding the larval host plant section in the additional habitat resources. If there are any obvious plants like milkweed and you're not sure if any of them are larval host plants, you can hold off on scoring that until you can get your plant list in front of a list of host plants for your region and then you can score that. Okay, that's a good point. I had one more question come in um, related to uh, thinking about the best time of year to complete the, um, the scorecards. And the question is, um, can the scorecards be implemented on a phase timeline if blooming varies throughout the state? Sure. Um, I was just going to note that it all depends what, what question you're you know, wanting to answer. So if you're to characterize peak blooming everywhere, it would make sense to have that sequential as the phenology sort of um, progresses across the state. And then the idea is just that you would try to do that same timing again, if you were to re-inventory, say in a year or in several years, um, just so that you have that consistency, just acknowledging that a survey in March would not be the same as a survey in September. Um, so. It's really, you know, meant to be um, whatever's most informative to the users. Right. And I would just add, I think in the user's guide, we acknowledge that um, particularly in some of the southern states, there may be, in fact, two peak blooming periods um, in a given year. Um, and so kind of taking that into account um, with the time frame that you're implementing or using the scorecard um, is helpful. Okay, I guess I'd open it back up to the technical team if anyone else has anything to add or recommendations. Uh, this is Dan. I would just encourage everybody to yeah, get out and try it out and see how it works on your system and get a feel for the different tiers that variability has there. There's no way to 
learn it, like just getting out and using it. This is Eric. I would just add, uh, you know, please do provide feedback and and um, you know help us make this this better and and let us know uh, what kind of results you're seeing. We have two more questions that have come in. Um, one, Allison, I'm going to send this your way. Um, there's the, a comment that since milkweed identification um, is something that's required in every tier, so at least being able to identify if milkweed is present, um, is there some sort of guidance document that's being created to help those identify milkweed who don't have any botany training? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful question. Um, we we just prepared a set of milkweed identification sheets for each region of the U.S. Um, and it's directed to um, transportation right-of-way managers, but should work for everybody um, involved in this effort as well. And um, we uh, wrote those up in collaboration with Xersus Society, and they should be posted um, in about a month. I could send copies out earlier if people are urgently running out and want them sooner. Okay. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, thanks for the question. And then um, lastly, a question about the management module. Um, Dan or others, could you clarify um, what the anticipated frequency is for the management module um, to be assessed for a particular site? Is it intended to be the same frequency as the scorecards out in the field? Yeah, so the management module, because you were evaluating actions taken that, that over the past year, um, that might vary a little bit in your organization and how you sort of track that. But we anticipate that would be done probably once per site at the end, you know, towards the end of the year. So, um, or sorry end of the management season. So maybe that would be, um, that could be end of summer, that could be towards the end of the calendar year. So that's that's up to you based off of how you manage the lands and what type of tools you're using. But typically once per year per site. Okay, great, thank you. Um, well, with that, we're going to wrap up uh, for today. So I want to, um, again, especially thank our panelists and, again, um, all of who served on the technical team to help make this uh, scorecard a reality this summer. Um, so thank you all for participating um, and sharing your expertise today. Um, I want to thank all of our attendees on the webinar uh, for your attention and asking some great questions. Um, and also utilizing the scorecard. It sounds like several of you um, are actively doing that already. Um, and again, I just echo Eric's comment, um, you know, please provide us your feedback and questions um, so we can make sure that this scorecard is the most useful um, to all of you as it can be. Um, we are planning a, um, a demonstration of the scorecard at the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group meeting next month. Um, I didn't mention that specifically, but if you go to the registration link that I gave earlier in the presentation, um, we have some more information about the hands-on training um, that we'll be doing there. Um, and that will be actually on an active rights of way um, courtesy of Ohio Department of Transportation. So happy to share more information on that as well. Um, and as I said before, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar um, to our website over the next week or so. Um, we can make the slides available um, and we'll send out additional resources like the milkweed ID um, sheet that Allison mentioned um, once they're available. So thanks everyone and have a great afternoon.